Well, we continue today in this series through the gospel according to John that we've entitled Believe. John told us in his gospel that he's written this gospel that we might believe on Jesus Christ, that we might understand who he is and that he might explain to us the glory of God. And so we continue actually in the first chapter still. And today's reading from the New King James Version will be John 1, 19 through 34. John 1, 19 through 34. As John, the gospel writer, gives us this story about John the Baptist. It reads as follows. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah has said. Now those who were sent from the Pharisees, those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. May God bless the reading of his word. Lord, we come as a people forgiven, standing in your grace, And we come and we read this witness testimony that John has given us. And as we go through these words today, may we see truth in them. It makes a difference in our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been going through this first chapter of the Gospel of John, and there's a lot in there. And and, and it came to this little passage this last couple of weeks, been looking at it and trying to get ready for today and listening to people talk about it and reading about it. And I'm just going, I thought there was a lot in some of the earlier stuff. There is so much to unpack in this one. Now, in a little while, it's going to be important that you do have those Bibles out. Jenny made me watch a movie yesterday that I actually really ended up liking um, called Show Me the Father. And, and in the midst of it, the one guy's talking, and he's talking about how he came to faith and stuff, and he mentions a guy who used to play in Seattle in the NFL named Ken Hutcherson, and I went, I know him in the movie. I said, I've heard him preach before. He's a really, really good preacher. And one of my favorite stories about him was he came and did a retreat for us years ago up in the mountains of North Carolina. And he's there, and, and we had a couple hundred college students, about four or five hundred college students from all over the Carolinas there at this thing. And he gets up there, and he's getting ready to preach, and he's like, get your Bibles out. Get your Bibles out and hang on, because we're going to go. We're going to go. And it, you, you're going to have to keep up. You're going to need your Bibles. Get your, you, got them, you, you got them ready? And he's getting up there, and he says, find it. Judges, chapter 16, and he's flipping in his Bible. He says, you got them? Ready? Ready? He says, all right, here we go. Hold on. One day. First two words of the 16th chapter of Judges, and he closed his Bible up and preached for the next 40 minutes on the words, one day. Then he got done with that, and he said, now open your Bibles up. We're going to go. We're going to go. And did the whole thing over again, because the next words were, one day, Samson saw. And he spent the next 40 minutes, preached for an hour and a half on those four words straight from the Scriptures, and it was incredible. 
But we do need the scriptures. And today we're going to need it because I'm going to reference some things in a little while that are not on the screen. And so you're going to want to have your scriptures and, and we're going to look at some stories. But let me recap what we've seen in the Gospel of John so far. One, we have the fact that the Word existed before everything. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this whole concept of in the beginning doesn't mean time as we know it. It means before time as we know it, God existed. And we learned through there that the, that the Word was how God created. In Him and through Him all things were made that have been made. And then we learn, John says, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he says, this is a great thing, he says, and we beheld His glory when He dwelt among us. And at the same time, it says, we didn't know Him. And the world didn't know Him. And we learned last week as we went through the next section of it, we learned that God's grace is limitless. God has limitless grace for His people. And that when He takes His sin, He just throws it as far as the east is from the west. And if you look at that, that's a continuous straight line. They'll never meet again, east to west. And we were reminded last week that we get God's grace by believing and receiving. And we talked about how believing is this word that is much more than I just know it. It's this word that I trust everything in my life to it. And then I just accept the gift that's given to me free. And that's a pretty cool thing. And that's the gospel according to John. And then we come to this passage. And there is so much in this passage, but I do like to give things for you to take away from it. And so I, I, I saw five real simple truths that are in there, but we're going to dig deeper into a couple of them. And a couple of them we're just going to brush the surface of today. So just be aware of that. And the first simple truth we're going to go is that John the Baptist knew himself. He knew who he was in relationship to God. And we've got two Johns working here, right? We've got John the Gospel writer and we've got John the Baptist. And as I mentioned last week, John the Gospel writer doesn't refer to John the Baptist as John the Baptist. He doesn't get caught up in some of his baptismal stuff early on and what he was doing. He refers to him first and foremost as a witness. And he talks about John being the witness. And so we come to those verses that kick us off. Now this is the testimony of John. The testimony of John, the eyewitness account of John. He's getting up there, it's like he's getting on a stand. He's going to be grilled. He's going to have questions thrown at him. It's going to be law and order all over the place. And there's going to be lawyers peppering him with questions. And he's going to get up there and he's going to give his answers. And the neat thing about this is he's not going to get confused. He's not going to get off track. He's going to give his answers clear, full, and direct. And so this is the testimony of John and when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Now this is an interesting word right here. And, I, and understand throughout the Gospel of John, you're going to see him talking about the Jews sent priests and Levites. The Jews questioned Jesus. And, 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 and what John says, and what John means when he says Jews, he's referring to the religious leaders of the day, not the people of Israel as a whole. It's a writing thing he does to reform us that the leaders, the spiritual leaders, the church leaders, those who would lord it over you are the ones doing this. And it's, it, it's an important thing, but it's also something, sadly, that has been misconstrued through the centuries and through the years. And, and not just in our day, but through countless generations. And it's been misconstrued to bring horror and tragedy on God's chosen people. And it's given people excuses to do things in, in the name of Christ and in the name of, of the church and in the name of religion that should never ever have happened in our history. And we don't have time to go into all those things, but it's important that we understand when you see John referred to the Jews, for the most part he's talking about the religious leaders. And what did they do? They sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem. They sent people from Jerusalem and they went to John the Baptist to ask him one thing, who are you? Who are you? John has this great witness that's going on. This is, this is taking place. Now, this is really interesting. This story that we're about to see right here takes place after John has baptized Jesus. He has already baptized Jesus. Jesus has gone into the wilderness, spent his 40 days out in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. All that we're about to see is happening after that. And John's ministry is going on. And he's in this place, you're going to see the name of it later. In, in, in this translation it says Bethabara, in, which is basically a translation for a place called Bethany beyond the sea. 
And it's not the Bethany that we hear later in the scriptures where Mary and Martha and Lazarus live that's just outside of Jerusalem. This is an area that's, that's north of there. And, and in, some, in some translations, in some places, it's an area at the time that was called Bethania. And it was east of Galilee. And it was in the desert. And you remember that he was out there in the desert. In fact, John was, as, as somebody said, I listened to he said, John was out there on a really cool organic diet. He was not eating processed food. He was eating locust and honey. Okay, I do not recommend that organic diet. But that's what he was out there doing. And he was dressed really interestingly, if you remember that. Wild hair, you know, camel camel hair, little belt. And and so he's wild and he's eating locust and honey. He's out there and people are flocking to him and to the message that he's there. And so they sent the Jews, send these Levites and priests from Jerusalem. They say, John, who are you? Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed. He said it right off the top, I am not the Christ. John knew who he was in relationship to God. And he didn't start the question by answering who I am. He started the question by going, this is who I'm not. Let's be real, real clear from the beginning. What I'm doing out here, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. This word Christ is a, is a, it's a Greek word. And if you understand about the scriptures in the New Testament, the New Testament is is basically written in Greek. But the people that we are reading about spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. So why is this all written in Greek? And it's interesting too. Boy, we as Americans, we go travel and we go places and stuff. And man, if they don't speak English, we just lose it, right? We're just like, we got to speak louder. Do you speak? You know, and we have to do all these things. These people spoke three languages. Three languages. They processed. They had it. These were intelligent in some ways. And they, 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 they moved between Aramaic. And that was the main language they spoke common day. And they spoke a lot of Hebrew because they were Jewish. And they wrote the Gospels down in Greek. Because Greek was the language of the Roman Empire at that time. Greek was the language from Alexander the Great on down that had spread throughout the world. And so when they write in Greek, when the gospel writers write it down, they write it so that the whole world can hear the gospel. If they'd written it in Aramaic, it would not have gotten outside of Jerusalem. And the gospel writers said, this is for the whole world, we're going to put this in Greek. And the word Christ is the Greek word for the Jewish word Messiah. It's the same word. And in fact, in, 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 in Jewish, they don't actually say Messiah. Mash, I can't even say it. Thank you. Mashiach. Okay, it's got a on the end of it, and it's this really strong word. And he goes there and he says, I am not the Messiah. I am not the one that people are waiting on. Because there's this whole sense at this time under Roman occupation and everything else that's going on that something big is coming, that the prophecies are going to be fulfilled, that the Messiah is going to come, he's going to liberate us. And, and so the Jewish leaders are going, are you the Messiah? And there were so many false messiahs that rose at this time who claimed to be the Messiah. And they're going to John and he says, I am not the Messiah. He knew who he was. And they go on and they said, okay, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Now, this is important. This is where we have to understand Old Testament. And you don't have to turn to this one. I'm going to put this one on the screen. But, but, but you have to understand Old Testament. And one of the prophecies, one of the great prophecies that these people would have known came from Malachi just about 400 years before this happened. So this was a relatively new prophecy. It's only about 400 years old. And it says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. There's this great prophecy that says, Before the day of the Lord comes. Before the day of the Lord comes. And in fact, in other translations... In other translations, I would point out that the, it says here in, in the ESV, it says the great and awesome day of the Lord. But in, in the New King James Version, which you have there in front of you, in the NIV, in the NASB, it says the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And, and there's this prophecy that before the day of the Lord comes, and we're going to talk about what that is, that Elijah's coming back. That Eli- and it's important to understand this and, and who Elijah is. Elijah was this great prophet. In fact, Elijah was a great prophet that never died an earthly death. 
Elijah was caught up in the chariots and in front of his successor, Elisha, who cried out to the chariots of Israel, I see them, and, and he was taken up into heaven. But there's this prophecy by Malachi that Elijah's going to come back before the Lord comes on this great and terrible day of the Lord. And we've studied through Daniel, and we've studied through Revelation, and we've studied through things, and hopefully we've come to understand that the day of the Lord refers not to the coming of Jesus Christ the first time, but refers to the coming of Jesus Christ the second time. When he comes back to judge the world. And they're there, and, they're, and, and before Jesus comes back to judge the world, Elijah is going to come. And so John is going to look at him and say, no, it's not me. It's not me. But there's some other things we've got to consider. We've got to consider the fact that that when Zacharias was in the temple and, they, and Gabriel came and told him that you are going to have a son, his name's going to be John the Baptist, he's the one who's going to prepare the way for the Lord, that he's going to come in the strength and the power of Elijah. And Jesus is later going to say, when talking about, the, about John the Baptist, he's going to say, if you understand, John was Elijah let them who have ears to hear, hear. And so we have what seems like maybe a contradiction here, but this is that law of double references that happens when it comes to prophecy, where, where you can have a prophecy that refers to a person or an event that's going to happen now that is a precursor of something even greater that's going to come later. And so Jesus is saying, John is like Elijah. He's coming before me here. This is a partial fulfillment of what Malachi says, but someday... Elijah's going to come back and the day of the Lord is going to happen. And they come to him and they say, are you Elijah? And John says, no, I'm not Elijah because this isn't the second coming of Christ. This is the first coming. But Jesus says he comes in the power and the strength of Elijah. And he comes as the one who prepares the way and he's there. And so they ask him, okay, are you the prophet? And they answered, no. They change gears. They say, are you the prophet. And it bases back to a prophecy from Deuteronomy in the 18th chapter that Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Moses makes his prophecy. He says someday the Lord is going to raise up a prophet. It's going to be like me. He's going to come from among you, but he's the one you should listen to. He's the one who has authority and power above all other things. And Moses is speaking of a coming prophet. And they ask John, are you the prophet that's coming? And the reality is John says, no, I'm not the prophet because the prophet's actually Jesus. And Moses is actually all these years before Christ is coming saying that that prophet is coming. Jesus is coming. And so he gives an answer to no and no. And so they're like, okay, who are you? Really, who are you? Because we got to give an answer to those who sent us. So what do you say about yourself? John started the whole thing. He knew who he was. He knew who Christ was. He started the whole thing not by saying who I am, but who I'm not. I'm not who you think I might be. I'm not who you want me to say I am. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. It comes from, from Isaiah chapter 40, that a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And so he's out there and he's calling people to repent and he's making a highway. Not only is he going to recognize God, not only is he going to call God out, but he's going to call people's hearts out to come to him. And John the Baptist is out there and he says, this is who I am. I'm the one who comes before. And in fact, I'm the one who comes before. And we're going to see in just a second, he says, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. So now John gives us a little more clue. Not only were the Jews who sent these, it was the Pharisees. It was the religious leaders of the day. And they ask him, why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And baptism was this act at that time, prior to John's ministry, baptism was an act where by Gentiles who came to become Jews were ceremoniously cleaned. Ceremonially cleaned. And, and so it was an act that had been reserved for the heathen to come to this. And John's out in the desert calling all people to go through this. He's saying all of you need to go through this. And they're like, what's your authority? Why are you able to do this? 
How can you come and baptize in all of this? John, you're no one. You're not one of us. What gives you the right? What gives you the authority? What makes you so special? And John flips the whole question. He says, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. Because John knew who Jesus was. This is the great thing. And hopefully this screen will catch up with us in a minute. There it is. Speaking, it happens, right? John knew who Jesus was. He knew who he was. He knew who Jesus was. And so he flips it. He says, let me tell you something. I baptize with water. It's symbolic. It's ceremonial. But there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandals trap I am not worthy to, to lose. He says, there is one coming. And we looked at this last week, and, and we've looked at this before, where John says, and, and, and the whole concept is that even though he's born after me in earthly form, he was before me. Because in the beginning was the Word, and He is the Word, and He is in flesh. And He says, here's one standing among you. There's something much bigger. And, and you can take your formalized religion. You can take whatever you want. None of that matters because Jesus is here. And He's standing among us. And it tells us John did all this in Bethabara beyond the Jordan where he was baptizing. But he says, I know Jesus is coming. And then he tells us this truth about Jesus. He says, Jesus is the Lamb. Verse 29, the whole verse says, Next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let me tell you, you could take this right here and you could preach on this for Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday because there's so much stuff in it. And we're going to spend just a little bit of time in this. It is one of the most profound statements in all of scripture and there's really two parts I want us to look at real quickly on this first one behold the Lamb of God the Lamb is an interesting concept in, in, in faith and this is something that the people would have understood and this is one of those places it's not going to be on the screen but I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to ask you to look at you in your scriptures here in just a second because he could have said so much right here he could have said here comes a teacher Great teacher. Here comes the one without sin. Here comes the king of kings. Or he could, could have said if he lived in today's time, here comes a really neat guy who will make you feel good about yourself and improve everything you do. John could have said any of those things, but he said, behold the lamb. And it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19. And if you want to look at that with me, and you got your Bibles, we're going to look at that real quick. We're going to catch up right there. It's going to go... There, and it's going to read Genesis 22, starting in verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering offering and the two went together the concept of a lamb and we're going to look at the rest of the story real quick the concept of a lamb offered as a sacrifice is an important part of the history of Israel and of the people who have worshipped the one and only God that exists and it's an important part in these days and, 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 and you had to offer a lamb and it tells us later it had to be a perfect lamb a lamb without spot a lamb without blemish and, and God says to Abraham I need you to go and sacrifice but Abraham are you willing to give up your only son let me tell you, I'm not. I'm not. 
Abraham was. And he says, Abraham, I want you to go and sacrifice. And isn't it really neat what verse 4 says? On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place. On the third day, he saw the place. And he takes his son there. And he goes there and the son's going, Dad, where's the lamb? And Abraham looks at him and says, God will provide the lamb. The story goes on. They come to the place. Abraham gets ready to do it took the knife, and in verse 11, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, I hear I am. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there before him was a ram caught in a thicket by thorns. God provided the lamb, and not only was it a lamb, but it was also a full-grown adult male that was going to be sacrificed right there that day, and God provided it. Verse 16 to route out the story. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. God provided a lamb. God provided a sacrifice, and because of the sacrifice, the whole earth, he told Abraham, is going to be blessed because of you. But the concept of a lamb as a sacrifice doesn't just stop there. It doesn't just stop there. Flip over to Exodus. Flip over to Exodus, the 22nd chapter. Oops, I may have put the wrong chapter there. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. It's the 12th chapter, so it's the wrong verse on, or wrong chapter on the screen. It's the 12th chapter of Exodus, starting at the first verse. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for the household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house, and they shall eat the flesh roasted in the fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. Do not eat it raw. Going down to verse 10. Yet shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains you shall burn with fire. And verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood of the Lamb shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of of Egypt. God says you're going to take a lamb and that lamb's going to be sacrificed because God's judgment is coming. But those of you who are covered by the blood of the lamb, you are not going to experience God's judgment. You are going to be saved. And the lamb is this visual, this thing that happens throughout all of the history of Israel. Let me take you to one more place in your Old Testament. If you can find the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, this also talks about the lamb and the significance of it. And it says this, Isaiah 53, beginning in the first verse. Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. If you read the next verse, 
He was taken from prison and from judgment, and he will and who will who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. John could have said anything when he introduced Jesus to the multitudes. He could have said anything. He could have said he's a great king. He's the Lord of lords. He's the creator of all. He's the word. Instead, he said he's the lamb. Behold the lamb of God. Behold the one who is going to be sacrificed. Behold the one who is going to die. Behold the one who is coming to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. And in his, in his life comes death because he must sacrifice himself. Why? To take sin away. That's what Isaiah talks about right there. He said, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was cut off from the living, from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. And he says, John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John said, let me tell you, this isn't just an ordinary man coming. This is the one who takes the sin away. This is the one we've been waiting for. This is the one who is the sacrifice. And he lays it out. i got to imagine, even if Jesus, as he heard these words and he knew the reality of it, it might have still been a little bit shocking, like, whoa. Whoa. But John got it. He said, here he comes. And we don't, even wanna, we don't even have time this morning to get into this whole second part where it says, who takes away the sin of the world. But what we must understand, and Scripture tells us over and over again, Jesus came to save. Jesus came to save. Jesus came to save. He came to bring salvation. He came to take away the sin. And notice that the word there is singular. It's not plural. It doesn't say he came to take away the sins of the world. It lumps us all together. We all have sinned. It's a sin. This world is sin. It has rebelled against God. And he says, here he comes. And then he goes on. He says, this is whom I said, after me comes one who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. But here comes one after me who's going to baptize us with something we can never imagine. He's going to baptize us with the power of the Holy Spirit. He's going to take away the sin. He says, when, when I baptized him, when I baptized him, I saw the Spirit coming from heaven and remain upon him. And, and, and I remember what the one had said to me, upon him whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John said, the one that's coming after me isn't coming to baptize with water. He's coming to bring the Holy Spirit. And there are different levels of baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we're not going to get down that path a whole lot today if you look at the Scriptures. But there's the, there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit when we, when we give up our sin in our life and we receive and believe that the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. And there's other things that we read later in Acts where the Holy Spirit comes and acts in power and baptizes in power in situations and stuff. But he says right here, here comes the one who's going to baptize with Spirit. And, and, and I'm going to tell you why. Because Jesus is the Messiah. You ask me if I am the Christ, no way, says John. It's not me, it's him. <laughs> Isn't that cool? John was in a great position. John was in a great position because he had followers. He had people coming to him. He could have done all kinds of things to build his worldly kingdom. And John said, it's not me, it's him. In fact, what we're going to see next week is John was okay when his disciples left him to follow Jesus. Because John said, it's not about me, it's about Jesus. You ask me who I am, it doesn't matter who I am, it matters who he is. And that was his answer. And I just find that to be an incredible, wonderful story. And it's a level of believing for John that says, I give my whole life to him. And John's going to pay for it. John's going to pay for it in this world. But I bet you he's doing all right right now. Here are the truths that we find in the story today in summary. John knew who himself and who he was. John knew who Jesus was. John knew Jesus is the lamb. John knew Jesus takes away sin. And John knew Jesus is the Messiah. And it's my hope and my prayer that as we struggle through our lives and we look at the things that are around us, that we can still come back and remember these truths. Jesus is the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And he does it for each and every one of us. It's not about us. It's about him.
Lord, thank you that we can come and read the story and see that it's not just words, but it's a continuation of your story and of your work from creation to Abraham to Moses to Isaiah, Elijah, to the presence of Jesus. Lord, our prayer should always just be simple. May we always believe and may we always be ready to receive that which you have given us, a grace that is limitless. And wherever we go, whatever we do, may it be the name of Jesus that is with us in all of our lives. We ask these things in his name. Amen. I chose a little different song for the 